Okay, well, that's us. And, and Justin's put us together because I think if you were here last, and last time around, last year, and a lot of you were, um, I rabbited on for a long period of time, and its connections to games might have been somewhat... So hopefully we'll be very connected this, this time around. So as, um, as Justin said, I'm a painter. This is one of my most recent paintings. I've been actually interested in Jungian psychology and Lacanian psychology, actually just psychology in general. Um, but particularly analytical psychology, and we're going to sort of deep in, delve into that, and, and this has that all in it, and hopefully we'll, we'll come to terms with that as we go through the slideshow. Um, the reason, and this touches back on the Lacanian stuff I looked at last time, the reason why I'm a painter, why I like to paint so much, is, is as a subject, I love to make images, and I love those images to be objects, like so physical things, so they, they become static, and you can go back and look at them, so you can go back and look at this thing over and over again. If, if I, I've got an image of that in my mind, but it's not, it's kind of like, you know, not fixed. Um, so I can imagine this painting, but then actually I can go see the painting. And the painting is kind of rewarding every time I go back to it, because it's, it's the same and I've changed to some degree. Um, I, these are uh, some photos that I took of, of a pavement near, a big pavement, so it's about three metres wide. So this is like a five metre chalk drawing. It's actually longer than that. Anyway, I've done a couple of well, sometime this, this year by one of my neighbours who I haven't met, but my wife saw, saw him do it. He's an eight-year-old, um, and and this has all the classic sort of issues of this image screen and you can, and the subject and object. So here you've got um, Cameron, his name was apparently about eight years old, um, in bed dreaming of the image of himself there, and he's got me written there. If you have, you know, so that's me. So it's kind of like he's projecting the screen of himself, like this avatar of himself into this, into this world. Psychologically, that can mean that he's a great, you know, great lucid dreamer. It could also mean that he's facing real problems in his life. So it's hard to say, um, but it's uh, it's it's kind of connected to this what we're talking about today. Um, so here you can see he's a subject, Cameron, imagining that he's this other version of Cameron who can throw knives at dragons and that kind of thing. Um, so and and so to a certain extent he objectifies himself in that in that third party th third party position, and that's something that's common to to a lot of games. And and um, <coughs> Cameron's developed a project called Project Clockwork, and you can play it, I think, in a beta version. Yeah, we've got a, a very recent build up there at the moment. So okay. Yeah, give it a go. And I thought I'd just use this then, so that when you're playing a game like that, you're imagining yourself as that avatar of, of that particular character in this case. And that becomes effectively, while you're playing that game, who you are, who you identify with, rather than your regular self. Um, and so that's pretty common to a lot of games. Not all games, but um, you know, it's so based on that, then you can sort of, that's, that's the basis of the discussion we're having today. Um, so when you think about Cameron's game, or when I was thinking about Cameron's game, and I, 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 I saw Cameron's presentation last year, but we don't know one another very well. We had a Zoom session, had a chat, mm. and, and I said, well, look, when I look at this game, you know, these are the, these are the stories I'm telling myself. It seems like it's based in this kind of Resident Evil, post-apocalyptic kind of um, technological landscape. Um, and then the character has these kind of Wolverine claws, but also has this ability to shoot grappling hooks, which is kind of the Spider-Gwen thing, and then also it's a technological-based um, power, so it's kind of connected to the Ironheart thing. And, um, and so, yeah, there's all these narratives that it taps into. So it's, it's pulling on all these things that already exist. It's not independent of those narratives. So it's, it's drawing on collective understandings of these things. And it turns out that I wasn't yeah. far wrong. <laughs> no, that was uh, our, our mocap actor wanted to be spider one in a game, and he didn't know that, so he mm. did well. Mm. Um, and also just want to clarify that the Cameron that he's talking about here isn't me. That's <laughs> a little bit different from my art style. Um, but I think that to me when I saw that picture is like that guy really wants to go back and play God of War. Um, <laughs> yeah, the the was was the the snake um, in the God of War remake. That's what that feels like to me. So sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, where do we go from there? So last time I spoke about imagining ourselves as Avatar, and I used a more crude example of. It. That you know the eight-bit sort of Galaga version of imagining yourself as that fighter pilot or that fighter, you know, and within that has this whole narrative attached to it, and that's a very common narrative. It was a huge common narrative in the eighties, you know, so you had lots and lots of stories around that that idea of space exploration, but not only space exploration, but space and violence kind of going on, and this Star Wars thing kind of was happening, 
And so that's a that's a common myth. So the, the the thing you're looking at doesn't have to be in high res, you know, to project into it. It can be actually, you know, as long as the story is strong, then you can imagine yourself into something that's actually quite weak visually. Um, interesting enough, though, when Cameron's not this cam, I'll, I'll just call this Cam because that's what that's what he called himself. Cam, eight year old Cam is doing he's doing this. He's not imagining himself as the monster. Um, which some games do, but it's actually uncommon for you to imagine yourself as, as the terrorist, the, the bad thing. Um, and and it, think about it, perhaps the reason why, if you take Glagger and flip it, that, that game would be extremely frustrating because um, <laughs> you would be wasting you know, hundreds, if not thousands of your own troops against three fighter pilots. <laughs> you know, I was like, God, can we not do this already? Um, <laughs> but also that you, you wouldn't be the hero of the story, you'd be a collective, you know, it's this insect hive kind of swarm that's coming into play. Um, and I'm sure those are games exist as well, but they're against the, the narrative flow of most games. Um, so how do I go further into this? And you could use Freud's model of the self to think about how this might work. Um, so without going terribly deep into that, we're egos, we have a sense of, of, of who we are. Actually, all of our sense of self is within our ego. You can separate a part of it off and think about it as, a, as your super ego, um, which is often the voice of your parents or authority figure. Um, but it's someone who's in the know or seems to be in the know, a person of authority. Um, and so that's, you have that in yourself. But there's also this part underneath that too that you can't get to through your ego, um, that, that in your subconscious that you, um, Freud called the id. And that's the little baby eating the spaghetti or, or the Weapon X character with, with claws that just lashes out and murders people and all the insect in us all, you know, the thing that's just, you know, creating its biological drives. And then obviously the, the other version of that, the, the, the super ego kind of version of that is the Ironheart the, the, or the, the Galaga Starfighter, the thing that does the right thing and it's fighting the right just cause. So there's both those things within us. Um, you know, super ego id, and we formulate them into a, into a sense of ego. We think our ego is good, but it's not. So it has both those things in it. Um, and, and this idea of consciousness and unconsciousness and pre-conscious comes, comes from Freud, as the first person to, to put it in scientific terms. Jung comes along after, is a, is a, um, a student of Freud's and agreed for a long time until they disagreed and then they had a fabulous falling out. Um, but they still respected one another. But he put forward a more complex version of this, which says, okay, you're part of a, a collective whole that you can think of as a self. So in a sense, we're all self, all self, big self, capital S, self. Um, but the part we know of that self is what we call our ego. Um, and the part that, we, that I'm presenting you to now, Dr. Chris Warpold, is my persona, but it's not me. I'm just, it's just a part of me. Um, and neither do I understand myself completely as an ego. There's parts of myself that I actually repress and don't want to know, and that would be the shadow then, the thing that I don't want to be. So if you're in a workplace and you hate someone in the workplace, that's probably representative of your shadow. Um, was it how you talked about projection? It's like we, we do that all the time. So we project our shadow onto others and say, aren't they evil, aren't they terrible? They're such a liar. <laughs> you know, all those sorts of things and you go, oh, actually I lie, I'm terrible, oh. <laughs> these kinds of things. And then also beyond that he said, okay, there's this another layer which he put in conscious sexual terms as the anima or animus, so if you're female, a male version or a male, a female version, an opposite, a, sexual, a sexualized opposite. Lots changed in that terrain since the early 20th century and the dialogue I think between what is an animus, anima and where that sits. I, I don't think you need to let that get in the way of this sense of there's this other thing that, that's, that I don't identify with, but actually it's part of me. If you think about it, we all have uh, Y and X chromosomes. We all have male and feminine traits. And they don't need to be in a polar opposition to one another as you put them forward. Anyway, so you get these ideas. Okay, well, we've got this the shadow self and this it persona self. So the Ironheart thing, that's the persona. I'm, I'm so good, etc. You know, like I'm the sh literally the knight in shining armor. And then there's the Wolverine type, which is then the raw savage beast who just wants to kill things that you know, annoy him or her. Um, so if we take this and then project this into Halo, um, then uh, I'm using Halo 4 because it's pretty classic, adopts Jung's models. Um, 
and we project ourselves as, as playing a game into our ego into Master Chief. But Master Chief exists in a world of self. So we're actually projecting ourselves into a, another world, another self. And within that self, there's these multiple components. So our ego hops into the Master Chief suit and we adopt the persona of Master Chief, even though we're not Master Chief. Um, and some of you playing that game will know more about Master Chief than others. I know very little. But um, he has a shadow, multiple shadows. They're all aliens that um, I think most, most of the time he ends up killing. Um, and then there's this other thing called the anima, um, in this case, which is uh, Cortana. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that forms this, this archetypal um, range of, of characters that are, and they're the only archetypes that Jung actually really specifically puts, puts down on paper. There's, we'll look at other archetypes if we get a chance. But he puts down these, these versions, and you see this play out in games over and over again. So that you would, your ego moves into a persona, and so in this case, and there's, there's good reason why it's masked and, and armoured, so you can identify as being within it. Like, so your ego can hop into that persona. The shadow then, if you look at it, I can't remember, what, what is this? Does anyone know what the shadow the is here? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, the didact. The, the didact? The didact. Okay. But the didact is like, ostensibly not all that different <coughs> to Halo, like, to the, um, to the uh, Master Chief. He's armoured, covered by penal figure. He's just, you know, or evil intention. And then the anima, um, which is, you know, this idealised, in this, in this case, in this version of the game, very sexualised version of, of, um, of a female form, but it's also a hologram. So you can't actually, you can't ever get to it. So the, the anima or the animus, you will never actually find. It's always a projection. Literally, she's a projection, you know. Um, so... She, she doesn't really exist. And also, as I think as the narrative plays out, maybe not in this version of Halo, but further versions of Halo, she's not exactly all good either. So she, she has a, like a bad side too. Um, and I'm wearing a Medusa shirt, so like that's, that's, the, that's a, a bad anima um, going on there. So this play, this play of these characters is, is pretty pivotal to games design, right? Um, so you've got Donkey Kong is essentially this. You know? So Mario is the everyman hero fighting Kong, who is his shadow, much bigger, much more powerful, much more aggressive, and does these bad things to them. And then the, I, what's the, what's the female character? Pauline. Pauline. Pauline, yeah. And Pauline's then the, the animus, the animus, somewhat out of reach, doesn't really, you know, it's the thing you're trying to get to, but when you get there, it's like, Pauline. <laughs> it's like, what happens? Um, so, so this, this kind of plays out. So I think what I want to, what my point would be here is just to say that this is actually quite important for you to sort of understand when you're developing games. Interesting, the dialogue was having with you, Cameron. This none of this was front and center in your thinking. No, it would have been helpful at the start. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. But I think I think we kind of um, just playing out the games and seeing our inspiration as we kind of um, ended up at these points naturally anyway. So we had. Mm. Um, we have a character who's uh, the persona and the ego, and a shadow, which is our boss character. Um, and he's also male, so that would be an animus. Mm -hmm. So we kind of ended up at these points. So I think a lot of what he's saying is, you know, comes very natural to um, narrative and character development in video games and other stories as well. So, um, yeah, yeah. And so Jung would say that this is actually coming from our collective unconscious, not just your personal unconscious, mm. but something deeper, something that's biologically in your brain, in your DNA, that um, this, this story we tell ourselves. Um, and it's, that seems the case in point, mm. that it's just playing itself out subconsciously within the group of games designers that are coming up with this clockwork um, project that has representations of these things. So I'm not even sure that, that the people who designed Halo 4 had this in mind, but it's like classic you know, archetypal um, delivery, um, as is Clash of the Titans, you know, it's a, a Greek myth, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, um, where do we go from here? Jung didn't really ever go much further than, say, ar archetype, you know, other than the ones I've put forward. He said, well, an archetype is something you can't go beyond. Okay, a mother is an archetype. So it's like, okay, a killer is an archetype. Like, how do you go beyond these things? Well, you, you can't really. It's like you either are those things or you aren't those things. You know, so that, um, so they're, they're archetypal things. So sometimes you can make sense of them, and sometimes you can't. 
And so the one in the middle is the caduceus symbol, which is um, still on the side of ambulances, right? But we don't really know why it's on the side of ambulances. So it's this like deep, deep archetypal image, imagery. We, we, we can't go beyond it for some reason. And in, in that case, you know, it's thousands, thousands of years old, that image, but it, but holds, it holds within it the idea of the DNA, the double helix. It's like, so, so some part of ourselves knew way, way back that this is really important and made fundamental. These two swirling snakes that fight one another, it turns out like the science goes, oh yeah, <laughs> that's a thing. Kids will often draw images of suns coming up over horizons. You probably did it as a kid, you probably can't remember it, but that is a classic image of a rising consciousness. So your consciousness is coming out of the dark, into light, developing ego. So classic stuff, of the yin and yang symbol. Okay, so when you take archetypes and apply this to games design, then often you need a broader scope of what an archetype might be. This is a, 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 the standard everyman hero, which applies to um, both, I think, the Clockwork, Project Clockwork, yep. and to Halo 4, and also to Captain, Ameri uh, Captain yep. America, and to um, the, War the Warhammer. Yep. Yeah, so all those sorts of things. And they specifically, you know, the sci-fi super, super soldier, they start being a, a no one, an everyday, every person, and then they've developed through technology to become this, you know, super warrior. And it's just a standard fantasy that we repeat in various various forms and looking at the clockwork game it's not uh, we, we were discussing there's different ways this might not have ended up but these are prototypes yeah, yeah. I just took screen grabs but yep. you can see you know on the in the armored version it's it's projecting into that same terrain you know yeah it's the it's the iron heart or the iron man thoughts um, the claws are you know the wolverine sort of thing but they're technological things so they're tapping mm. into that it's the same dialogue that, that through technology we can move beyond an beyond an everyday person and become a hero somehow um, and it's you know aligned with our culture what we're thinking of oh we'll solve our problems in the world by technology we'll get there that will save us it's the yeah um, so and then if you apply this idea of persona ego shadow we project our ego into this character and we adopt the, the character the persona does, does she have a name valley valley yeah. so, so we become valley Mm -hmm. um, and then Valley has these gauntlets that seem to give her yeah, superpower. Big, big claws. Yeah, and also they're the things that yeah, throw the ground. Yeah, she's a bit like Spider-Man. Spider yeah. yeah. So. And so she confronts what I think is, first of all, this, this box um, on the table there, that mm -hmm. green thing, is, seems to be her shadow. So it's, om it, it, it's, it's a male voice and it's ominous and creepy mm. and speaks in riddles. Um, yep. So that's pretty classic shadow you know it's got all the things that i don't like in it and saying things i can't understand mm. um and then the seemingly the big boss um fight is with a, a male version with a big sword mm. um <laughs> yeah a big glaive i call it okay. um which uh, i think it was a subvert, subvert the expectations there so um originally the boss was a shadow and an animus at the same sort of thing whereas the shadow is that person that's speaking um and he becomes sort of like an animus um in the revealing afterwards, um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, so you can see this this theory that are, you know Jung's theory is on mine, just dropping in and literally dropped on top of, mm. well, Justin dropped on top of Cameron like two weeks ago. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it, it's like, and you could perhaps do it with your own games and think mm. about that. Uh, interestingly, in this case, the the persona is facing its shadow. Um, and, it's a, and in this case, fighting its animus. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to be in confrontation. You're generally in confrontation with your shadow. You don't necessarily have to be in confrontation with your anima or animus. But in this case, that seems to be the job that you kill your animus or at least subdue, subdue the animus. Yeah, there is a cutscene. Um, <laughs> it's he doesn't die now. Okay, so it's all good. Yeah. Well, that that is also mm -hmm. very very. Um, Jungian in mm. terms of the myth, because like the Medusa never dies, the power never goes away, even once mm. her head's cut off. It's like the 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 anima of the animus is like Cortana; she can't mm. really be killed. She just, just mutates in terms of just mm. AIs. So these kinds of things. So this is this is classic stuff, right? Mm. Um, where we're in that terrain. So how are we going for time? Where are we? Where are we going? Uh, we got a little bit. When have we got till? We were ten minutes behind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean. <coughs> This is, is yeah, yeah. Should we go further? Yeah, a little bit further, yeah. Because there's some <laughs> archetype stuff I, I want to inject in there. Okay. 
So there's general archetypes, and you can, and these weren't developed by Jung, as, as my understanding. So they've they've been teased out by various psychologists and various pop cultures, etc. Put these ideas of of specific um, archetypes. I call them general archetypes because the archetypes that Jung actually defined are on in the grey slide rather than the colourful one. But the colourful ones you can have a lot of fun with, particularly with games. If you go to something like Star Wars, and I'm just trying to use these general archetypes, because that's you know, my, my culture where I came from, but most of you would understand what that culture is. Um, and if you look at then the archetypes that Luke Skywalker represents, he starts off as the innocent, he becomes an explorer, who becomes a hero, who then gets his magical powers and then put, deploys them in a heroic way, and then ultimately ends up in a sage position, where he's like sort of all-knowing um, position. Leia goes through, um, you know, from being a rebel outlaw to a hero to a ruler to a lover to a back to a hero and then finally a caregiver. This is across the, the first, well, from New Hope, those three films. Um, <coughs> then you're going down the list in those first three films, then Chewbacca's just an outlaw and then a hero and then he looks after <coughs> Ewoks. So it's like a, it's a less of an arc. Um, and then if you go to the, the um, what are they, prequels? No, the, the sequels. Sequels, so, yes. Yeah. Then Ray is a very undeveloped character. And you might like her, so I'm not saying anything about Ray other than she's underdeveloped. She goes almost immediately from being an innocent everyman to becoming a hero magician. Mm. First film, all done. That's it, that's the arc. There is no transition for her beyond that. It's like, so why am I watching this film? <laughs> it's like, it's, okay, well, I'm watching a hero. So you can take some of this thinking and apply it to your games design too. If you can take a, a character and move it through stages, and we had a dialogue around around this character, around ba ba Bally, yeah. Bally yeah. Um, and thinking, well, the, in the games design, I should actually pass her through transitions of development, mm -hmm. which will make the, the character engagement and enjoyment stronger. Not because of the <coughs> gameplay per se, but because of its psychological engagement. Mm. Um, like the films that, you know, go back to Star Wars, the, the films that Ray's in, they're fantastically, brilliantly beautiful, you know, films. Mm. Just for me, not psychologically engaging. Um, so, and you, I think you can tie it back to the transitions within the archetypes. Um, you can also then look at archetypes will have shadows, um, that every hero is also a villain. You know, as people point out, you know, they blew up the Death Star that had hundreds of thousands of people on it. You know, they're terrorists. You know, they are villainous in their behaviour. Um, even though the, the Death Star killed millions of people on Alderaan, that kind of thing, so they do the maths. Um, but there's all these opposite positions that you can that you can have in these things. And so if you want to set up a real good baddie, a real, real big right. shadow, then you'd occupy a lot of that space. And if you do that, oh, I went wrong. Shadow. 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 <laughs> if you do that, then you end up with a, a big baddie like the Emperor Palpatine, who's like an elitist, he's reclusive, he's abstinent, he's earnest bore, he's villainous, he's corrupt, he's a bureaucrat, he's all judging, he's torturing, he's a magician, and he's a tyrant. He's like almost every bad thing, not all of them, but almost every bad thing you could put together in, in a particular character. And it's interesting in Luke's arc that he moves actually into that terrain he not just doesn't become a sage, but he becomes elitist, and he becomes reclusive, he becomes abstinent, and he becomes known as bore. He's a boring character by the, by the end of it. Um, at least in that story arc. You know, they you know, try to revive him in The Mandalorian, but it's like, good luck with that. It's like, <laughs> not much to do there. Um, so this, the story arc, I think, is really important. Um, did you want to talk to that? Yeah, because um, I was talking about the different archetypes. We had a bit of a chat about this on our Zoom call mm. this week. Um, and I don't think we... A lot of these are like you have innocent outlaws, heroes, every man, and stuff like that. Um, and one of the character I, I thought was very difficult to, to work on is the jester. You see a lot of earnest boars because that's the, the shadow to that. Um, but I feel like I think I was giving more Japanese examples like Goku and Vegeta, earnest boar and jester. Um, Aang from what's that show from? Avatar. Avatar. <laughs> um, and. Um, Luffy from um, One Piece. One Piece. Wow, great. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and what was really interesting with doing that is that we had a voice actor and a mocap actor for our uh, boss, um, and we were sort of giving a uh, rundown of what our main character Valley is like, and we said it's a bit foolish, a bit like um, Aang and, and Goku and um, 
Luffy. Um, and just naturally, he started to... We didn't give him actual prompt. He just sort of started to become an Ernest Ball. So um, he looked up videos on YouTube on how to talk in a British accent. Um, and yeah, it, the character just evolved on its own. It's like the, he sort of just knew that that's what the, the shadow was for that, um, for that ego. So I thought mm -hmm. that was very, very, um, very, very interesting. Um, I feel like it's a hard one to do though. I think the every man, the, the soldier kind of is yeah. a lot easier to do, especially if they're wearing plate armor, you don't have to do any face will. Sort yeah, of stuff. yeah, yeah. So these, this is probably a good side to finish on in terms of mm. those those archetypes and thinking about game avatars. Um, the majority of games are you know the hero magician or the outlaw, um, and for good reason. <coughs> That's the story that people like to tell. Um, mm. That I'm sticking it to the man, or I am the man. Mm. Yeah, sorry for the gender there, um, mm. but it's like I'm the person of power, or I'm fighting the power that be. That's mm. a better way to put it. Um, the, there are games where you, you know you can play as a ruler or an explorer or a creator or an everyman like Minecraft, Minecraft does a lot of those mm. sorts of things um, and you've mentioned the jester and the jester goes quite well with the hero um, because mm. it makes it kind of it's, it's the solution you know, it's a spider-man thing spider-man's always telling jokes yeah. and that sort yeah. of thing you know to alleviate the tension that he's actually committing violence on these people all the time <laughs> um, uh, but there's as you move down that list, I think then lovers, caregivers, innocents, sages, there's, there's less and less game activities you're heading down into mm. those archetypes. Um, and it, I can't think, and maybe you can think of a game where you, the game is just to tell jokes, like just to be funny. Mm. Like it's more of an ancillary role that you would add to like a hero role or even a villainous role. Mm. You know? Like the Joker, for example, is a classic example of that. Yeah, um, yeah putting the outlaw and the jester together. And yeah. Got the Joker. Um, yeah. So look, there's a, a journey beyond that, but um, I'll leave it for another another day. <laughs> cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> we are behind, but we have a quick couple of questions on character and story. And anyone got any questions or thoughts? Even Doctor McLennan. So a good one. So everyone, pay attention as I throw this across the. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you're interested in this terrain, it's like there's a if you just Google um, or Google Scholar games and animation, you find a pretty good paper written by Richard Dare, who's a, who's a games designer. So just games and animation, Google Scholar it would be the first thing that comes up. It's relatively easy read, 25 pages, but it goes across all of this kind of stuff. If you're new to it, it makes it a lot more easy to process. So again, it's just games, animation, and, and, and imagination. I, I just had a comment, which is the the jester in Shakespeare is usually the most is the wise, the wi wisdom so the and sage. the sage. Yeah. So the jester is often the sage as well. Is there a game where you're a jester sage? <sighs> Don't know. T like the, the that, that's a very big character. That's a question Shakespeare. for Blake the soldier. He'll tell you. Come on. Oh, I don't think so. Ah. I do have some questions though. Um, I was wondering to what extent this applied largely to uh, Western narratives and whether having the everyman or the jester or one of the other um, roles, uh, one of the other archetypes that you listed towards the bottom of the um, list as the end of the character's narrative, whether that's represented um, in literature that we know of or whether it's more represented in um, non-Western literature. So there's a couple of questions there, but yeah. the first one is that the theories that I presented today, really coming from 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 Jung, who's Western European, male Western European, um, and then they were followed up by Joseph Campbell, who's again male Western European. Um, so the theories are coming from that source, but the, both those those academics or or researchers or psychoanalysts or whatever where you want to pigeonhole them did extensive cross-cultural research and, and their conclusion was that these, these you know, the hero with a thousand faces, which was Campbell's idea was, well, this is cross, you know, and they pulled out lots and lots of stories to back that up. But I still don't, you can't get away from the first position that they are, as I am, you know, white male European descent. And so therefore it is skewed in that way. But the, the next part of your question was like, does it follow that arc? Well, you can certainly look to a lot of Eastern stories and Eastern philosophies that you move, that the hero becomes the sage. That's a, that's a standard. So you take the Masashi myth in Japan, that's exactly what happens there. Series and series of confrontations. Um, eventually, you know, that's actually got 
Like that's that has the Jungian psychology, Masashi, that book uh, has the Jungian psychology built into it. You know, uh, Utsu that is the anima and always, you know, so it all just plays out exactly that same way. And that's a cross culture example. So there's definitely confirmation bias going on in, in this stuff. Um, it would be interesting to tackle it, to see it tackled from a complete base up, ground up position. I think the idea of, but it's not, it's, it's different, so it's Western. Awesome. We might just leave it there because um, we're behind by about 10, 15 minutes. But um, again, Chris and Cameron are here. Actually, Cameron's talk's up next. Yep. But Chris and Cameron are here all day and they'll be at the networking drinks afterwards. So yeah, if you want to discuss this further, grab them and have a chat. Um, but thank you, guys. Thanks for going through. Okay, so the next sessions, we've got our next paper track.